about images. We'll take a minute to review what we've done so far, and then we'll continue on. Here's a page with an image. an image tag, image, IMG, will have at least two attributes, an SRC attribute, which indicates what the image is, that needs to be the complete name, including the file extension, uh, I think I mentioned last time a JPEG can actually end in several file extensions, just JPG or JPEG or JPE. Um, <coughs> the three main image types um, that you have on the web are JPEGs, GIFs, and PNG files. Um, you then typically have an alt attribute, which you should have, and that is used to give a brief description to people that can't see what the image is. Otherwise, that can be confusing for people. We'll talk a little bit about, uh, we'll talk more about accessibility later on in the term, but just put always an alt attribute on your images. I mentioned before that images don't really have an ending tag. I mean, they can. Uh, you can leave off the ending tag and that's okay. You can do this, which says it's an ending tag or and a, a starting tag and an ending tag wrapped into one. Or you can even do this, <coughs> or you make it starting tag, ending tag, like that. I usually do this. Uh, we talked a little bit about copyright, and we'll talk more about uh, that today. This particular image was licensed under a Creative Commons license, which means that the owner of this image, owner of the copyright of this image, allows people to use it. So I'm not violating any copyright law by using it. And I probably should mention that. I, I gave a source for it, but I should say this is licensed under a Creative Commons license from so on. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this yet. Uh, images are what are called inline tags. There are Generally speaking, two groups of tags. There are inline tags and there are block tags. Pretty much most all of the tags that we've seen so far have been block tags. And what do I mean by block tags? I mean they stack on top of each other like blocks. So if we look at this page, we have a header, we have a nav, we have an <coughs> H1, we have an LI, another LI, another LI, a section, an H1, a paragraph. When we view this page, they all stack on top of each other. Here's the H1. Here's the LIs. Here's the H1. Here's a paragraph. Here's another paragraph. Here's an H1. Here's a paragraph. List. And so on. The two things that we've talked about in class so far, and there were more mentioned in the book, um, that are not block tags are inline tags and links are one of them so if you notice right here Google is a link and if we look at the code the link is here it doesn't the next thing doesn't start on a line below it it starts right alongside of it and image tags are like that as well this caption that I have here is right alongside of the image as part of the paragraph. Now, if you don't like that, there's ways to change it. Uh, and you can investigate on your own. You can talk to me about it. Uh, but that, that that's one thing that people typically uh, get annoyed with is that uh, in an image, uh, with an image, uh, 
since it's an in inline tag, if you have text next to it, it's going to appear next to it as opposed to underneath it. All right. Simple fix would be to just to create a, sec a paragraph for this to be in, and then the text would be underneath it. Um, I mentioned that this is a Creative Commons license, and that means that whoever owns a copyright has voluntarily allowed, is, is published the fact that they give permission to people to use this. All right. Now, Creative Commons licenses can be limited. For example, uh, it could be limited to non-commercial works. So you could use it uh, if you were a not a business, maybe a, a charitable organization or a personal web page or something like that. Or you can authorize it for commercial use, which means that anyone can use it, even a business. You can allow it to be used with or without alteration. All right, uh, derived works that's called. So for example, Depending on the license of this, I may be allowed to go in and, I don't know, alter this image to show a kitten running through the crocuses or something like that. All right? It all depends on the license for that. So that is what Creative Commons licenses are. You can, if you're looking uh, on Google and doing a search for it, when you look for images, I think I did a search for spring. Uh, I went into tools. I selected under usage rights. And label for reuse with modification uh, means that I can use it and change it. So these pictures I'm free to use and change. The creator of those images have allowed me. This is label for reuse. This is for non-commercial reuse with modification, and this is for non-commercial use. So the top one is the most uh, uh, allowing, I guess. Exactly. The top one is the most, uh, most free as far as the use, because anyone can use it and they can modify it. There's actually, I believe, and, and I'd have to double check this. I believe there's even more categories, but like those are the four main ones. If you search on a uh, on many uh, photo sites, like Flickr is a famous uh, website for photos, you can also search for uh, Unsplash is a good website too. Okay. Uh, you can do a search for and search for any license or all creative commercial use modification or you can search for US government works which I believe you can you're, you're free to use any US government no nor no known copyright restrictions some of these include uh, things that are said to be in the public domain uh, the public domain is is typically one of two things uh, most of the time it's pictures that have passed the legal length of time for copyright, which again, I don't remember off the top of my head, and they, that changes fairly frequently. But like, if you found an old photograph from the 1800s, that would probably be licensed under, uh, um, under, uh, uh, lost my train of thought, public domain, thank you. You could also put images in the public domain. Like if I take a photo, I can say, hey, look, here, no copyright, you can use it, and then you can use it. Remember, you, you obtain a copyright for something simply by taking a picture. So all the pictures on, the, on your phone, you own the copyright of. All right. Now, proving that you own the copyright is another question. If it, became, if it was a photo that you know, became popular on the web and you wanted to prohibit people from using it, you'd need a way to sort of prove your intellectual property and all that. You'd be best off talking to a lawyer about that. Know that for this class, the copyright laws are less restrictive than for the general public or for the general business, uh, general businesses. In fact, if you look on Canvas, I have, I think in the first week, a little blurb that reviews uh, copyright for 
academic sites for educational purposes. Fair use guide handout. This talks about how for educational multimedia, and this applies for any multimedia, not just the Zoom and the CSS are fighting each other. Um, for images, for example, no more five for an artist. For the purposes of this class, you could consider that five from a website. Um, music, uh, we don't get into that really in this class. I suppose you could. Uh, and we, you possibly could get into it in a uh, multimedia class that I teach. Uh, you're up to 10% or up to 30 seconds, whichever one is, is less. So if it's a three-minute song, what, that would be 180 seconds. You could sample 18 seconds of it. If it was a longer piece, you could sample. If it was over 300 seconds, so if it was six minutes, you could uh, sample 30 seconds for it. All right? You still have to give attribution for it, where, where the, you, you got it and all that. All right? Fair use is a notion that even with copyright material, society has the right to use it in certain contexts. I, for example, I could quote a book if I was reviewing the book. That would be an example of fair use. All right? Uh, that would be that's the best example I can think of. There's, there's other examples as well. You can use things in satirical works. You can satirize something, and that would be considered fair use and all that. Um, I, I, I don't mean to present myself as a legal expert or a lawyer in this matter, so I'm definitely not. But I do want to make you aware for it, because the Internet seems to be... Uh, at sometimes a, a the Wild West where no one pays any attention to copyrights. And I want to, uh, you know, uh, in the classes I teach, I want to emphasize that that, isn't, that shouldn't be the case and that we should respect copyright law. Yes? Um, on our websites, if on the images are all, they're in the free copies that we got from Google that are able to reuse, as long as we put in the footer that they were um, for reuse, do you need us to cite each image where they came from? Um, Ideally, you would cite the ones that they came from. Uh, you could put it on a separate page. Like a you could, page yeah, you could make a reference page. You could make the font really small on the bottom in the footer. Okay. You know, uh, if push came to shove, if you if you had a bunch of them, they were from there. You could say obtained through Google search. I, I doubt I would complain. Although the letter of the law would be that you would cite each one. Okay. Yes. But if you own all your own. If you own all the images, um, it probably would be good to mention that just so I don't think that, okay. that you got them from somewhere else. Right. You know, uh, images are copyright of me, you know, or, or you know, and, and just say that. Um, you wouldn't really have to do that, you know, on a public website, but just here, if I, if I saw a photo and I think, oh, you're, you know, are, are you using that from someone else, that would be like a little reminder that, oh, okay. Now, even if you're taking pictures, there's several ways that you can get pictures. Or, or let, let's, let's rewind. We sort of talked about the Creative Commons or public domain is one way that you can get pictures. The other way to get pictures, of course, would be to take them yourself. All right? What are some other options for obtaining pictures? Purchasing pictures? Yeah, hiring a, photo, a photographer and purchasing them. And even purchasing them, that sort of you have a split off of two things. One is you could just hire a photographer to go and take pictures and make sure that they know that you're going to use it for a website because they may charge different rates if it's for something like that as opposed to like taking, you know, graduation pictures for your kid or whatever. Um, the other thing you could do is stock photos. All right. Stock photos are a way where you take and you uh, photographers publish a list of photos that uh, you could purchase for use. And what typically you'd look for would be royalty-free stock photos where you are simply charged a flat amount and not charged for that. 
Uh, the internet sort of really put a dent in photographers' stock photo businesses. Back in the old days when not everyone had nice cameras, you know, and you had to be a professional to have a nice camera and so on. And, and it, was diff you know, it was difficult to communicate, you know. Uh, photographers would have albums of stock photos that you could purchase and they could charge a pretty good amount. Now, you know, you get someone, people get days of pretty good pictures with some relatively inexpensive cameras. And, you know, what do we know from economics? When the supply goes up, the, uh, the, the cost goes down. Uh, we could Google a stock photo site. There's, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, shutter, shutter stock. Oh, let's go to that one. Behance. These are royalty-free images, again, which are good because you don't want to have to pay like per use of it if you put it on a brochure or whatever. And a lot of these are going to be like really good quality. So let's look for spring here. I don't know, I look at these like I'm, I'm picking out wallpaper for my house, like which one of these do I like? You can click on this and you can see, notice they publish it with a watermark to keep you from just using it outright. Uh, and you can purchase it. Uh, and again, these usually purchase uh, a purchase plan. You could get, for example, 750 <coughs> images per month for 27 cents. Uh, an image, which would be 199, uh, and so on. Ten images a month for 29. Now again, who buys that many images? Sorry, Jessica, not that many images. That many images. Some relative. That many images. Companies or or uh, advertising companies might purchase uh, that kind of of thing. Other ones would offer different plans. Uh, that you can do, you know, you could, for example, you know, order two, or if you know, if it was something that you weren't doing very often, maybe you would pick five images for forty-nine and do that. Again, it's going to be better quality than you probably would take with your own camera, unless you're a pretty good photographer. All right, uh, it won't necessarily be custom to your organization. For example, if LC wanted to show uh, you know, students studying, uh, you know, in, in the college center, right? Uh, ideally, they'd take a picture of students actually sitting in our college center. But they might be able to find a generic enough picture here, and it might be cheaper just to, to purchase that. The disadvantage, of course, would be if you looked really closely, it's like, hey, that's not on our campus. I don't know any of those people, all right? Uh, but the advantage is it could be cheaper. All right. Uh, let's see, in fact. Let's look for professor, professors lecturing. That'd be pretty bogus if there was a picture of me in here. <laughs> professor teaching. So if you purchase rights to a photo, do you have to cite it then? Uh, that is a good question. It would depend on their uh, uh, licensing agreement. Um, I'm thinking you do not, then. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking you do not. Um, Most websites, actually, I see too. To do that? Okay. All right. Interesting. So, yeah, something like this. Could you really tell that that's not happening at Lorraine Community College? Probably not. Whereas something like this, like, oh, we don't know this guy. You know, he's not a teacher. See, there is a picture of me. <laughs> no, I never, I don't wear ties, so that's probably not. All right, anyhow. Um, these are different ways that you can obtain them. And it, like many things, the, the better quality that you get, the more that it's going to cost. Ideally, if you hire a professional photographer to come in and take the pictures, that's going to cost more than a stock photo. And, but it probably will be better. And if you took the picture yourself, Again, with some exceptions, we have media people here at LC, but 
uh, for like a typical organization, if you've got the hobbyist photographer, yeah, they might be able to take reasonably good pictures, but it wouldn't necessarily be as good as a stock photo or uh, a professionally taken photo. All right, I did mention about lowering the size of a picture. Uh, I do want to illustrate that. Uh, this is the original size, so I'm going to make a copy of it. So if I go in here and edit this, and I hope I can remember how to edit in Paint 3D. Go to three dots, thank you. Canvas. canvas up, okay, there you go. Resize image with canvas. If I go and make this, let's say, let's make it dramatically smaller. If I make it 100 pixels by 67. All right. And do I have to save it? Yeah, let's save it. Okay. So now I look at this, and I got a itty-bitty image. Okay. All right. Let's say I say, well, that's way too small. And I go in and I edit again. And the original size of it was 960. So if I put it back to 960. If you notice, it becomes what is called pixelated. All right. You've lost the information. Pixels represent dots on the screen. And images uh, are really stored as a series of dots, but stored in a compressed manner. And the idea is, is when you make a picture smaller, you've lost information. You've lost detail. So therefore, making it bigger, that detail's gone forever. And therefore, the program has to guess about filling in the missing extra pixels. And the program does its best, but as you can tell, it's not able to recreate the original image. Now, there's any number of photo editing applications out there. The only reason I picked Paint is because it's here and it's on every Windows machine. So if you have a Windows machine, you can do it. If you, do, if you have a Mac, uh, you can do these things with Preview. Uh, you can also do some touching up with Preview, as you can with Paint. Um, if you want, though, there are other uh, photo editing tools available, and there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, including Adobe, which you can, uh, what do you say, subscribe to and use the cloud version of it. Uh, there also is an open source uh, version uh, of photo editing software that's of good quality. Open source software is one of those things that shouldn't seem to work, but it does. The idea of open source software is you have people from a community that work on a project, make enhancements on a project, add features to some software, and then make it available typically for free. And they include with it what's called the source code, so you can modify it. So, for example, if you don't like the way Word works, tough luck, right? You have to live with that. But if you wanted to download OpenOffice, you could actually change the way the program works if you wanted to. And there's communities that do that, and they maintain official releases and so on. Well, the GIMP is an example of a, an open source photo editing tool that you can download for free and start using it. And again, it's a very high quality. So let me copy and paste it again and I can open with <coughs> GIMP is actually an abbreviation for new image manipulation program if I remember it takes a little while to fire up
But you can do some cool things with it. And best of all, it's for free. So here we have the image, all right? Now we can do a bunch of things with this. Uh, and again, this isn't a class on photo editing. Uh, but you can look and, for example, you can uh, rotate the image, scale the image, flip the image. Uh, what do I want to do with this? Colors. I can change the colors. Uh, one of the things that we'll look at in a minute is you can brightness and contrast. If you use an image as a background image, which we'll talk about that shortly, sometimes you want the, the background image to almost look like a watermark. In other words, you don't want the solid colors because the text against the solid colors becomes too difficult to read. But you sort of want the picture to be like faded a little bit, where you can make out what it is, but it's not as vivid. So if you play with the brightness and all that, if I did that, I could wash it out, maybe adjust the contrast and the, and if you imagine text on top of that, it might be easier to read than on the original. You can do opacity too. Yes, you can. Uh, opacity is only valid for uh, PNGs and GIFs, though. All right, you, there's no opacity. You can set opacity, but if you save it, if you export it to a JPEG, you, uh, you lose the opacity. When you save something, you typically save it in a proprietary format. In other words, the GIMP's own format. And then to uh, export it into something that can be used on a website, you have to export it, and then you can choose JPEG, GIF. Uh, PNG or other possibilities. Uh, there's some cool things here. There's some filters that you can do uh, if you're feeling um, artistic. What's a fun filter? Um, you could add a lens flare. Oh, you could position it. All right. Uh, you can add a lens flare, flare to it. You can always undo it. You can make it look sort of painting-ish, um, artistic, and oilify. Make it look more like a painting. It's really hard to tell in this example. Um, let's try another one. Let's do a cubist one. That'll be obvious. All right, and so on. It's one of those things that, like, once you, you know, the first time you load this and start playing with it, you know, you'll spend hours doing that. Then you might never do it again. All right? But at least you know if you have, if it's there. You can also do layering, which is important. Uh, layering is important if you want to make like composite images. Like let's say for example I wanted to put sort of a kitten crawling around back behind these. What I could do is I could add a layer or I could first set the transparency of this layer. I could then add a layer then I could erase and I have a different version of the GIMP, but I could erase stuff. Oops. Oh, that transparent layer is on there. It's over top of it. I'm going to switch these layers around. And then I could erase stuff out of here. 
I'm using this magic wand selector. You could also select a bunch of different ways. And then, well, what the heck, let's find a picture of a kitten. going to get rid of the layer that I added and I'm going to open as layer pick the kitty all right if I switch these layers around you can see the kitty sort of poking their head out underneath that all right the point is, is you can do cool stuff with the GIMP. It is, I'm like, it, it, you know, I, I'm not going to like argue to say that it is as powerful as Photoshop is, but as a business person, if you're doing cost-benefit analysis, this has a cost of zero, <laughs> all right? So that's very attractive. I, for example, I use the GIMP whenever I do photo manipulation, simply because I can do virtually everything I want to do and is, is free, so I don't have to worry about that. Okay, this isn't a class in photo editing, no. Uh, you are welcome to do as much or as little as, as you want as far as this goes. This is a requirement of the class. At the very least, a web developer should be able to do things like fix a picture. What do I mean by fix a picture? I mean if it's too big, make it smaller. Crop out some unnecessary stuff. Uh, if it's too dark, make it lighter. If it's too light, make it darker. Those kinds of things. And those simple things you can typically do through, uh, through paint even, or preview on the Mac. But if you want to do some more advanced things, you can do that. So I encourage you to play with this, but unless you have questions, I really won't go over this in too much detail. All right, now, on to background images, all right? We can go and we can make something, a background image, for either the entire page or for a section of the page. Okay? So let's find, let's do our spring again. And let's look for label for reuse with modification. And let's look for large pictures. Okay. Let's see. That one's nice. Okay. So I'm going to go and I'm going to download it. And I'm going to call it BG for background just to make it easy on myself. And I'm going to put it in the same folder as the rest of the stuff. Now, <coughs> this is where, how do I want to say this? Images can either be there because they provide content to the page or because they provide decoration. Because of that, Images can be put in CSS or HTML. Generally speaking, images like if I had my page about spring here, maybe I would say crocuses are a, a, a flower that blooms during spring. This is what they look like. That would be extra content on the page. I could use images, though, as just plain decoration. I just want a nice, and therefore, there's a place to put them in CSS as well. So images are the one thing that sort of straddle the line between HTML and CSS. It really sort of depends on what you want to do with the image. So I can make an image of background, and I can do it for a portion of the page, 
and I can do it for the entire page if I want. I'm going to start off doing it for the entire page. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to edit my CSS. And I'm going to say body background URL bg.jpg. forget if I have to use quotes around it or not. I don't. Okay. So now we have that as the background image of our page. All right. It looks kind of good, except for some of the text is hard to read. Like this text is hard to read. All right. So maybe with this color scheme, white and yellow is not a good choice. So, what colors could I use? I could look up the colors or whatever. Um, uh, or I could just say, well, black probably would be a good color. You can specify an image and a color. And we'll talk about when you might want to do that later on. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the color there just as a reminder that you can specify both. So let's make this black. Let's make this blue. Let's make this pound sign eight eight zero zero zero. No, eight 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 zero zero. That actually should be a darker shade of yellow because it's red and green halfway turned up. And I can look at that. And, well, there is really still kind of hard to read. because, And that's the difficulty, sort of, of using a background image, right? Most good, attractive images are going to be a, a wide contrast of colors, all right? And therefore, it's going to be difficult to read. What we could do in this case is do what I suggested and, and change the brightness and contrast of it. And that might work. Or you could look for an image that, that uh, doesn't have uh, this issue uh, in it. I might as well, might as well do that. Uh, go ahead. I have a question about the size. Uh, so the image displayed larger than the page. Yes. Um, how do we know what size is the actual um, What will happen, and we'll see an example of this in a minute here. It will display the image as many times as it needs to to cover the, the complete page. And it, it, the size it will be will be the size of the actual image itself. So I could make this smaller. And would that change from one browser uh, to another? It, it definitely could. All right. Now, the absolute size of the image won't change. But how much of the image you see could change. All right. I'll go in and I'll make this image. Scale image. Right now this is 28.8 big. I'll make it 14.40. So I'll make it about half as big. And save it. Now if we look at this. Oh. All right, there you go. And you can see more of the image. And again, on a smaller monitor, it might look like this. On a bigger monitor, I obviously can't show that. All right. Now let's go and let's fade this a little bit. Um, I'll go and and I will turn the brightness way up. And 
and turn the contrast way down. Now if we view it, well, you can kind of see the image, uh, kind of destroys the effect a little bit. Uh, it might just be that that wasn't a good image in particular to, to, to use, but we can at least read the text. All right. Now there's a couple of other things that we can do with this to make this more readable. Uh, I, oh, I'm still open in here, right? So I can go and undo this. Let's go and resave that. All right, we're back to the original bright picture. Now, I could go and give a background to all the elements of my page. So I could give a background to the Header, nav, section, and footer. That'll work. That'll kind of spoil the effect, though. All right? But I could do it. So I could say header, comma, nav, comma, section, comma, footer. I'm going to say background white. All right. Well, that kind of blows it, right? The one thing I could do, though, is I could change it so that it's not solid. I could make it partially uh, opaque. So I'll set the opacity. Uh, and I always have to Google this one. So, 0.5 means 50% see-through. And that might be heading in the right direction where you can see it. Maybe I'll bump it up a little bit. All right. Now, thing to keep in mind, and we're going to make this page really ugly, all right, is that I can go in and give backgrounds to other things as well. So, I could give a background to just the header or just the H1. Let's do H1. background URL crocus.jpg Alright, that's very hard to see. Uh, let me go in since you have the opacity set up there, uh -huh. you have to change that. Yeah. One is solid. And white. 
right, I'm actually seeing the green part of this image. Clearly, I'm just demonstrating doing things, all right? This is not meant to look like a good page, all right? So do keep that in mind. Don't print this out and, and post it to rate my professor and say, look what this guy told us to do, because I'm not telling you to do this. I'm showing you how to do things, all right? So keep that in mind. Another thing that is popular, and I'll real quick, I'll just make a copy of this, and this is sort of an effective thing that you can do sometimes, is you can use a background tile, all right? Opacity was set. The paragraph words are also yes slightly, so you can change that so it shows up better. Ooh, that's that's a challenge. I remember being challenged with that before. Okay. I'm not a hundred percent sure. That I would try googling that one. find real quick CSS tile for the background something that looks like well that would oh. these are designed to link together And if you have a tile in the background, then you have less of a need to make the opacity white. You can do something, though, like give these guys a width. Let's just put this out there, and then we'll talk about it more on Thursday. What I'm doing is I'm saying make it 60% the width of the screen, use an automatic margin for left and right, and what that will do is make this page look like this. Okay? Notice that image was only one iteration of this tile, and it tiled it together to form a coherent thing. Now, this is starting not to look so bad. All right? And this is sort of a common thing to do, to have uh, a tile in the background just to give some decoration, give some feel to the page, and then have a background around the other things so that they, uh, that the text does stand out. This is typically what I use for background images more than uh, the other technique, but they're both valid. All right, we'll pick up on this on Thursday, talk a little bit more about it, and then talk about the next topic that we have.